laying flowers, setting fires. It is Amir Suleiman's debut film and that was released months ago. And Iman was so proud to be a part of that and support that release. And so we wanted to just hold a moment to celebrate Amir and celebrate the film and, um, and unpack it and learn more about it. So Amir, if y'all don't know who he is, he is a world-renowned poet. He uh, you know, travels the world with sharing his gift of poetry and is, and he, he will be mad at me for saying this, but it's true. <laughs> He's often referred to as the greatest living poet. Um, so yeah, if you don't know, now you know. Uh, he's a recording artist. He's a Harvard fellow. He's an actor. He's a filmmaker, director, a writer, and producer on the Emmy-nominated show Rami. And he is a beloved member of the Iman artist roster. So we're so excited to hear from you today, Amir. And then um, there you go, Binta. Thank you so much. Yes, Brother Amir. I'm super excited to hear you today. And we have our dear dear sister Angelica Lindsay Ali, also affectionately known to many of us across the world as the village auntie. Um, she is a community scholar. She is a trained African dancer, a storyteller, educator, beautiful soul. Uh, she's also a certified sexual health educator. Um, and she founded the Village Auntie Institute, which I myself and many of our community members are students of and so grateful to her um, for starting. And so in that institute, she talks about a variety of things from holistic anatomy to, you know, sensual nourishment to motherhood to remembrance. And so I uh, wanted to lift up our sister, Angelica Lindsay Ali. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Vinta and Sadia, for first for the invitation. I was so excited when I saw the email because I am not only uh, the facilitator of today's conversation, I am a huge fan. <laughs> I bought Corner Store Folklore when I moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And I remember the first time um, hearing our brother Amir and feeling like for the first time someone was speaking to me in the multiplicity of the black Muslim experience. Before that, I felt like people were trying to shake the Detroit out of me. They were trying to shake the black girl out of me uh, and trying to infuse a foreign identity into me through um, inculcation of, of foreign culture and uh, Amir's work really is a coming home to oneself. So I'm very excited for this conversation today. I have watched the film five times now, um, including just now. And so I'm really excited to have conversation about the intentions behind the film, um, to unpack some of the imagery and really just to celebrate the beautiful visual representation we have of black joy, black pain and black resistance. And so with that, um, I see my video is spotlighted, but if we can spotlight Amir, uh, we can get started with the conversation inshallah. Yes, we we'll, we should be able to do that. And also to everyone who's here, we would like to record this and um, post it on YouTube afterwards. So uh, we would just like to let y'all know and get your consent. And uh, if, if you don't feel comfortable, please go off video. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings, everyone. We begin with praising Allah. And sending prayers upon his beloved Muhammad and uh, yeah, I have to thank um, Iman you know Iman is an organization that's always been very close to my heart um, close to my work you know I try to stay close to their work as well and the different iterations and manifestations over the last uh, I don't know 10 years 15 years however long it's been a long time and uh, I've always appreciated their, their, their growth. And, you know, I say this almost on every program because um, I say it out loud so that I can be held to it. But, you know, Iman has, you know, with my manager even, you know, they have, a, they have the, just the automatic green light. So if they call me and if that's at all possible, I'm always going to respond. And I'm always, you know, if it's physically, the laws of physics um, allow, 
then you know, inshallah ta'ala, I'm gonna I'm gonna be there when they call. And so, you know, I'm always happy to hear from them and I'm always happy to contribute. And um I'm literally jumping right out of the uh Rami room, writer's room. We're working on season three right now, out of that Zoom and into this Zoom. Um to that, but I was uh, looking forward to it uh all day and all week. And um so you know um Sadia in, in particular, who I met before Binta, but you know Binta as well, and, and so many other other uh, great people that have held that together um, and continue to grow and serve people. I'm, I'm deeply grateful and asking Allah to bless you, and uh, and my sister uh, Angelica, the village auntie. You know, from the first, well, actually, I, I met her before I knew her work. You know, I met her in Arizona before I knew her work. And she mentioned Konos of Folklore. Konos of Folklore is the, you know, that's the OG, OG collection of poetry, you know what I mean? So, you know, that was a little subtle flex that she, you know, everybody didn't get that, but that was a little subtle flex. And she knows what time it was back from like 2000 or something. I think I released that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, as I was more properly introduced to her work, you know, via uh, Instagram. And then I remembered that we had met before. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that she, that you exist. I'm, I'm so grateful that you're doing the work that you're doing. The work that you're doing is so necessary. You know, I have four daughters myself and, you know, I've, I've, I've sent them, you know, to her for, just to, for just, um uh companion companionship just uh uh mentorship questions curiosity you know all kinds of things um it's such a valuable conversation that she's having that she's uniquely fit to have and so i find you you know very very valuable and so precious and um you know you must be uh protected by by all means so we're making our firm intention and declaration out loud for that. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, so I don't know where, where should we start as far as this, uh, this, this, this. Um, there are there any? I, I would like um, more um, to if there's because uh, I can talk a lot about the about the film. So much I poured into it, and so much meaning that I got off of got off of my chest, so to speak, and put it into it. Um, but I, I, I thought that the best way to use this time, if there's things that, you know, folks are curious about or things that, um, you know, you know, I, I would like this time to be valuable to, to, to you guys. So, you know, however you would like to jump into it, I'm ready. So my first question is, what was your intention behind making the film? Because it's like you've moved from the page right to the stage and now to the screen and it seems like such a seamless transition which is not always mm. as elegant as you've made it look right it can be very awkward very choppy but mashallah when, when i saw the film i was like of course mm. it's beautiful of mashallah. course it's, of course it's exquisite because you know it's a mirror but it's just such a seamless transition so what made you decide to put your words in this type of format well, first, um, Ashala, thank you, thank you, firstly. And, you know, for me, the poetry, the type of poetry that I write, it was always very visual to me, you know, even that poem, Cornerstone Folklore, there were very often, there's one or two in every book or album, there's one or two or more that are like a narrative where there's like a conversation happening. Uh, sometimes between me and a woman or me and an old man or me and a, you know, this, this, that, um, that exchange uh, is kind of one of the styles of poetry that I, that I like to write. And so in my mind, I'm always experiencing it as a visual thing and I'm, and I'm using language to describe something that I'm looking at, you know, and I've always been a big fan of film. Like that was my, pastime my my that's since I was a kid that's what I just love to do I love to watch movies um I would prefer the movies over like going to the club or like doing a lot of other things I would really love to watch movies um and uh and so I always kind of secretly wanted to 
direct, you know, but I was, um, you know, directing a movie, uh, particularly when you're thinking of a whole, like a feature film, it's a, it's a very uh, daunting undertaking. Um, but I was like, you know, let's, let's, let's take a go at this and, you know, it, you know, why not? Let's just take a go at it. But just that the, 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 the murder of George Floyd that we all um, witnessed, you know, the, the first lines of the poem are what, are what came to me, you know, it's like, I'm supposed to write about this, but like, what else can we say? Like, what, what are the new words for this? You know what I mean? I've used all the words. I've wrote all those poems. I used up all the words. There's no, there's nothing new about it to make me write something new, but a feeling like I wanted to contribute, you know what I mean? Um, and so that those lines of, you know, it's hard to uh, find new words for old things where that came about. And so originally, actually, this piece, the visual for it, originally when I was writing this poem, I was writing it sitting on Breonna Taylor's bed. That's what the, that's why the main character in the film is sitting on the bed. The original manifestation of that visualization as I was writing, so when I say she wants a new poem, I want a new poem too. That's actually what I'm talking about at that moment. At, through the iterations, it ended up, because at first I was going to be in the film, but then I decided to just direct and write and, and hire an actor for the film. Um, but the first visual in my mind was I was sitting on the edge of her bed and writing um, this, you know, the, the, the line, it's like uh, buying a new dress for a dead woman, sewing a new dress for a dead woman. Um, that's where those, those lines came from, yeah. So then those images were coming to my mind and, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna just take a go at just trying to present this as I see it in my, in my, in my heart. Wow, subhanAllah. So you were, you were literally sitting on her bed. Now, this is where I put myself in my mind that I was like, I'm, I'm, the place in my imagination where I was writing the poem is I was sitting, I was in her room, I was sitting on her bed and that's where those words came to me, you know, yeah. You know, and it's interesting that you say that because there's there's so many layers in the film. It's, and I'm like you, I love films. I love, you know, films like yours that are very artsy, like you have to really get real cerebral and, you know, with it. But it's, there's so many spiritual elements and you seem to reference the unseen mm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Was that intentional? Was it, was it something that just happen because I feel like there are so many layers of spiritual representation um, that represent the multiplicity of black faith and, yeah. and the one line, you know, I'm speaking as a former five percenter, right? <laughs> Where you said I didn't make the rules, I'm mm -hmm. just doing the math. You know, <laughs> right, right. The 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 re representation to like uh, reference to like ring shouts. Was that was that intentional, those spiritual elements, or was it something that just sort of happened. No, it's, it's well, both. Um, when I say it's, it's intentional, meaning that's, um, that's always finds its way into my art, you know, um, those, those phrases and no, and not, and it's not because I'm consciously like, okay, I, I want to drop this line or this line, but it's in my heart. And so as I open my heart, that's part of what spills out, you know? Um, so, um, you know, uh, um, uh, I was going to actually mention another reference from another poem, but I can come back to that. But in, in this piece, both visually, what I'm doing with the, with the characters and the space and the color, um, and then also what I'm doing, um, you know, as far as the, the, the literature itself, the poetry itself, um, it's always straddling that line between a very when I find a poem really successful, it's when it's very, very rooted, like it feels visceral, like you can like taste it and feel it. And at the same time, it's like transcendent. So I don't like to write only terrestrial poetry where it's like everything is there and it's just all dahir. It's all just outer forms, you know? Nor do I want to write stuff that's inaccessible, that's just in the clouds and no one understands, you know, what's happening but to be able to straddle that line that is rooted enough that the heart can invest in it, but it's transcendent enough that the heart is like reaching for something. It's, 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 it's enticed and curious about meaning and deeper meaning. And then the heart is drawn into the poem or the song or the visual, you know? And so 
you know, one of the things actually that I think that you would, um, inshallah, appreciate is a lot of it was built upon the dynamic of the masculine and feminine, actually. So when we talk about the head and the Batin, the, the, the manifest and the unmanifest, the known and the secret, um, the, um, the present and the absent, you know, um, the interplay of those is really the, the axis upon which that the visual story is told is the relationship between the feminine and, uh, and the masculine. So you know you you know you speak in my language I know. <laughs> right now, inshallah. Okay. And, I, and one thing that I I see in your work, and I've told other people, and I, I think I, I think I've heard you say this once on Clubhouse, is how you have such um, intimate access to the divine feminine, and how you're not afraid to represent that in your work. And I found it so powerful that you know the subject matter about what you were speaking. Um, you know, the, the idea of black violence is something that we often think is only attributed to black men, but you open the film and with women, right, with the women and the women were ever present, like even at the end, it, and it, it was not just, you know, women dancing and frolicking about, there was a strength and presence. How do you, how do you intentionally like make sure that there's a balance between those two, the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And, and is that something that you find difficult as a man? Um, and is it something that you um, intentionally put into place? Yeah, uh, and that's, that's another one of those things that's, um, you know, present, even in, you know, going back again to that poem, Cornerstone Folklore, where um, a lot of those, especially the narrative ones, is an interaction between me and a, and a she, you know, the she is never necessarily named or the relationship to the me and the she and the her is never exactly perfectly delineated. So I leave it without um, giving it like an exact form per se, but um, meaning the nature of the relationship. And actually there's a poem, my greatest poem, I think, um, inshallah, it's a poem called The Lover, The Lover, and The Beloved, um, which is more the most focused on this particular point, maybe than anything else that I've written, is mostly an intercourse between um, uh, uh, myself and the her or the she or this, you know, this, this you know, divine feminine attribute. And um, it's not difficult for me. It's actually, I, I default to it often. And I think, you know, I think it's because of our masculinity that that happens. I mean, that's the, you know, the, the magnetic nature, you know, like a, like a, um, a masculine man, uh, one way to describe a masculine man is a man who is um, this is, this is an odd way to say, it, but I'll explain it. Um, it's like feminine deficient. Right. When I say feminine deficient, meaning the man who is masculine or masculinity, even if we talk about it as an abstract concept, it's in need of the feminine. Like it's in a, it has an obvious need because it has a deficiency. It's like the, um, it's like the, uh, the difference between the ionic and the covalent bond. So like the, you know, the, the atomic bond where this atom knows that it needs electrons. So it's going to seek out those bonds. And so um, I think the natural um, manifestation of masculinity is that it's, it draw, it's drawn to femininity like a thirsty person is drawn to water. And the same because, because it's deficient of water, but the same thing for femininity as well. But that coming together out of need is a very powerful and beautiful you know, um, manifestation. And that's, I think one of the, one of the kind of subtle underlying keys in this is that is that we need each other, you know, and you know it's you know it's popular now to be oh I don't need this and I don't need her and I don't need the man and I don't need and I, you know but I think that's a lot of you know, I mean it's I don't think that's real I think that's um pain talking but you know there's a there's a there's a there's a I'll, I'll only speak for myself. There's a need. So my, I default to that very easily of engaging this feminine energy. And you'll find it in all of my 
there's there's no project where that doesn't happen since you know since corners of folklore in the last 21 years now god 21 years is that crazy subhanallah dang we're old man so <laughs> anyway so um and, and you know it's not just a need you know but it, but it's a it's a it's a love it's a loving need and it's a desire and it's a um and i enjoy it you know it's something um pleasing to me so when i'm writing it and once i start engaging with that feminine energy it's like it becomes like electric to me you know it becomes it animates the language in a way that um without it it, it doesn't so um i love to do i love it's very natural for me it comes to me naturally and secondly in the in the piece you know what was important for me is in the conversation about power that I didn't want to make the women powerful by making them masculine as if that is what power is, you know? So I, you know, and I, and I talked to, even on set when I was talking to the women, uh, we had girls, we had a pregnant woman, we had elders, you know? And I was saying, you know, in this moment, you are going to embody, and I let them describe in their bodies what this looked like, all of black femininity, all of your ancestors and all of your descendants I'm placing in your bodies now for this, you know? And so they understood what was to be expressed and I let that express. And I said that same thing to the men, particularly to my lead and to my female lead, my male lead and female lead. I was like, you're carrying all of black masculinity. You are all of your uncles and your grandfathers and your sons and so on. And I want you to, 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 to hold that. And with that beautiful interplay naturally manifested uh, between this masculine and this feminine and this, uh, and you know, so there were the women and then there were the men and then we see them together and the final shot of our male lead and our female lead together and not being that representing real power and real perfection, you know, yeah. Wow, and I, and I, I just have to say, the male lead, I didn't catch the, the sister's name, but the male lead, uh, J. Alphonse Nicholson. Yeah. Yeah. I love him. Yeah. And when I saw him, he's he just, there's something about his gaze that mm -hmm. just pulls you in and draws you in. And, and, and I, I think you see, he also, and I don't know him personally, but I also feel like in his work, he embodies that balance of divine masculine and divine feminine. Mm -hmm. And I love how you said that you did not want the women, you know, to express power through being masculine. Mm -hmm. And I think about the symbolism, right, with the dancing in the cipher. And when that sister starts to dance and she's wearing white and she moves and you can see, you know, her body rippling and moving underneath the fabric, that is powerful and mm -hmm. it's grounded and rooted. So I want to talk a little bit about that symbolism, you know, the, the, the cipher around the coffin, um, the elder who's sitting in the coffin, but smiling, mm -hmm. and there are children who are smiling, there seems to be maybe an allusion to peace or resonance in the afterlife. Um, there's a police car that's yeah. standing up. Can, can you talk a, a little bit about that imagery for us? Yeah, those um, symbols, yeah, wow. Um, so, you know, I, I, I have to make a little disclaimer. Uh, the disclaimer is, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about these things, but it's almost like, um, it almost feels a little like profane because it's like, um, when I say profane, it's like, uh, when I articulate the images and I give them exact form, it can kind of take away from the, the layers that are experienced at the same time. But for the sake of the conversation, well, let's, 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 let's dive into it. So the, you know, the coffin as the main set piece in the first part and the car as the main set piece in the second part. Um, um, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of um, different kind of layers of things that I wanted to say with that. One of the things that I wanted to say was about uh, you know, I didn't want to avoid the, the conversation of black death, nor did I want to indulge in it. You know, I, you know, a lot of, um, black art and I make, this makes sense to me. I understand it 
um, and especially around that time, you know, around that time, there was a lot of, you know, different people and rappers and singers and, you know, corporations and everyone was trying to like, wanted to say something because it felt like something should be said. So I understand it. But a lot of it was just about uh, black pain and black suffering. And although that needed to be acknowledged, and so I didn't want to avoid that or just like totally circumvent that. Um, but I wanted to talk about like black life and black love and black joy. And so part of the coffin imagery is um, dealing with this very natural thing of death. And it was a very kind of risk, it felt risky to me because I was like, I want this coffin. I know I want this casket here. In, in the center of the frame of, of these scenes, but I don't want it to feel morbid. And I was, I felt take, like I was taking a risk, like, am I gonna be able to pull this off? Am I gonna be able to have this here, but for it not to feel morbid? Um, and we had, you know, those are my nieces that I had that are standing next to the, the, the elder at the casket and relaxed and smiling and, you know, one indicating not having uh, not having a fear of death. Oh, that sun is jumping on my. Not having a, a fear of death, you know, um, and also that death is not the worst thing, you know, for for some, for hopefully all of us, it'll be the greatest day of our lives, you know, and us um, coming to on the other side, us um, rising out of that place will be you know a joy and then there's also an idea of taking people out of their grave you know of among our ancestors and so on that are buried meaning the stories are buried the legacies are buried their contributions are buried their voices are buried by us telling these stories it's as if we're able to pull our ancestors out of the grave you know and um and bring them forward to the benefit of our children for our babies for our young people for ourselves and so um, that in contrast with the police car, the police car, this was actually a referencing a uh, sculpture by um, uh, like an installation by Hank Williams, who had like the Dukes of Hazzard car uh, sitting like that as a, um, a sculpture uh, reference that I, that I used for this idea. We wanted to turn the police car that way because it totally and radically disempowered the car. Like, because at first, you know, it's like, oh, should the car be busted, or bust the windows out, or, you know, these things. But I was like, no, I want it to be totally and utterly impotent, to radically take all of the power out of this symbol, which is a symbol of great danger. I don't know if any of you guys have watched Judas and the Black Messiah, but, um, you know, there's a... Uh, without getting any, anything away, but there's a line um, that Lakeith says where he was like, you know, niggas fear a badge more than a gun. Like, you know, anybody can have a gun, but a badge, it's like you have the whole a whole army behind you. So that car would strike so much fear and it represents so much danger. I wanted to, that's, you know, we open the doors, we put the steering wheel in his hand, like this car is, this, all of the power of this car has been totally compromised by this black man. And, you know, when I was even directing Alphonse, I was like, you know, it's not, this isn't wild, this isn't, you're not enraged, you're not crazy, you're just, you're powerful. And you know you 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 you're you're dominant you know over this um, symbol you know of power you know and you know you're you know you're sitting in it you're holding the steering wheel in your hand you know what I mean and um, so this um, symbol and the symbol of the casket one of them laying horizontal and one of them vertical which also deals with this masculine and feminine degrees. And one of them, um, uh, and even the number, the 644, it's, it's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that goes into all of those things. But um, for the most part, I wanted to bring life to the casket and I wanted to take power from this symbol of authority. 
Mashallah. Mm-hmm. I, I will say you did a masterful job of directing the film mm-hmm. because I felt that when he was, and my father was a police officer. Mm-hmm. A conversation for another day. Yeah, yeah, myself as well. Okay. Yeah, but but seeing seeing him hold that steering wheel and just the look on his face, it was mm-hmm. like it, there wasn't anger, there wasn't rage, but there was something that yeah. just held you and drew you in. And I like how you. Um, brought in, you know, Judas and the Black Messiah. And, you know, we know Fred Hampton was very young when he was involved in activism. And I have a 15 year old son who's just coming into knowledge of self. Um, I'm 5'11", he's 6'1", right? He's 15, he's my baby uh, and I worry about him. And so this Mm -hmm. is a film that I have not yet shared with him but I would like to, what do you think is what would your advice be to sharing this intergenerationally? How would you, how would you, how would you recommend that we introduce and if we should introduce this yeah. film to our youth? Yeah, you know, it's um it's interesting, you know. Uh, you know, it's interesting for, for a few reasons. It's a very good question. Um one it 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 speaks to something about just the power of the power of art. Because I remember in the original screenplay, there was an actual conflict between the main character and the police. So you saw the police come through the door and you saw that interaction. And I ended up cutting that out. The other thing that was that was in the original screenplay was littered at the bottom of the police car, you know, on the ground were like police helmets and shields and batons and stuff like that, you know? And I've taken those out as well. And um, it's interesting because all of the indications of actual violence have been removed from, you know, in, in a way it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a G-rated film, you know. If you were to say like what's actually in the film, there's like no curse words in the film, and there's no actual violence in the film, and the, um, there's no blood in the film. There's no, you know what I mean. Um, uh, however, the the gravity of it is very present. You know, it's a very, um, you know, without those things, there's power to it. The reason I'm mentioning that, which doesn't exactly answer your question is, um, you know, sometimes artists, Muslim artists or others, sometimes they think to bring about power, like to, to demonstrate power. It's like, oh, I need to use this type of language. I, use, I need to show this, I need to do that in order to make, to, that, that that's where the power is, you know what I mean? Um, but there's like a greater power, a deeper power um, found in just really raw, true uh, sincerity that can be achieved, you know, like my poem, Danger, Dead Man Walking, or any of these other poems, you know, um, there's, you know, there's no, uh, like I said, they're, they're, all of my poems, I'm, I have my whole catalog is like rated G, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, however, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, there's, 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 there's some heaviness where you have to ask that type of question. Like at, at what age is it okay for my, you know, my child to engage with this? And um, so firstly, to answer your question more directly, you know, firstly, you know, obviously, you know, um, you know, every child is different. Every family is different. Parents are different. And obviously everyone will make the decision for their children um, as they see fit. Um, for my children, and my children are in it, you know, you see my daughter Asia in it and uh, Suhaila was uh, was out of town visiting her mother, but, um, you know, my daughter Sakina uh, was in it, my wife Indigo was in it, and, um, you know, uh, I had my nieces in it, um, and they watched it, obviously, you know, after it was done. The way that I've dealt with media, which was different than the way my mother dealt with media with me, you know, my mother was extremely strict on what we could watch and couldn't watch, you know. I remember we couldn't even watch Popeye because he solved his problems with violence, you know what I mean? Like we couldn't watch, um, I, I used to like Transformers. I used to collect Transformers, the toys, and we couldn't have Megatron because he transformed into a gun, you know what I mean? 
So like my mother, you know, and you know, for her, she's raising, you know, three black boys in Rochester, New York in the nineties and Rochester was in the nineties was a zoo war zone. And so, you know, she was just extreme anti-gun, extreme anti-violence, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and so there was a, but there was one TV in the house, you know what I mean? It was one TV in the living room, the TV, you know, I don't know how old everyone is in here, but there was a time where TV used to go off, like TV stopped, you know what I'm saying? Like there would be programs and then the programs would just end and there was no more TV until the morning, you know what I mean? Um, so it was, so I'm saying that to say that it was easier to control, you know, what we watched. It didn't take long, you know, before, you know, I'm raising my girls, you know, uh, my three girls, you know, by myself since they were in elementary school up through college now, you know, my oldest girl is almost 21. And um, I realized that that style of um, censoring was just impossible because media is everywhere. Media is in the pocket, me like just, and it's constant and it's ever increasing and it's like seeping through the walls, it's just everywhere. So I pivoted and I changed from trying to limit what they watched, you know, to heavily engaging them about whatever they watched, you know, and make sure they had the tools by which to digest or to process whatever they are watching. So it's a very long answer to say that. I would, um, of course, every parent, every you know, child is different, has different constitution for different you know things. But that um, to allow them to see it and just engage them about it, um, because I know we love the idea of veiling them from this reality. But you know, yeah, if you six one at fifteen years old, yeah, he has to know what this thing is. You know, what this world is. Um, and uh, I'm gonna tell you a, a little story. I know I'm giving very long answers. Um, so I hope okay. we get to all the questions. That's but, okay, uh, we, love long, I, we love long answers. Yeah, I'm doing, I, you know, cause I, I released this film during the pandemic. So I never really did a screening, you know, I, you know, I never got to watch it sitting next to other people and having that experience. And, and, um, and I didn't do virtually any promotion for this, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, and so I haven't done, I haven't talked about the film a lot, so I'm, I'm on one right now. Um, I, was, uh, I was in elementary school. And so my mother moved us out of Rochester to Penfield, which was a, a almost all white suburb of Rochester. So the school I was at, Bay Hill um, Elementary, or uh, junior high school um, was, almost all white, there was no black teachers, no black administrators, no black janitors or, um, and you could, in the school, of, it was a big um, junior high school. So in, I don't know, six, 700 kids, you could, uh, you could easily count the number of black kids. So it's a very, very white school. So one uh, day at the end of the school day, um, one of the other black kids comes up to my locker and said, I can't remember the names exactly, but it was like, you know, Todd called Malik a nigger, right? And I was like the unofficial black student body representative. It's like he was coming to me, like I was gonna give whatever the verdict was or what was supposed to happen. It was kind of like that that, um, that scene in, in, in Malcolm X and Spike Lee Malcolm X when they having the milkshake with, with Sister Betty and the man, you know, the pigs hit, Brother Johnson over there with a nice stick. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like that. And when he has to go out into the jail and stuff like that. Anyway, it was that type of situation. So, you know, again, I'm in junior high school. So, I mean, I, I had to be 12 or 13 years old at this time. And so I'm like, okay, so, I, so I'm going to go talk to this guy, Todd. But everyone is leaving school while going out to the bus loop, right? And it's hundreds and hundreds of kids. Like I said, it's a big middle school. And uh, I kind of spot this kid, Todd, from the back. Because I'm thinking maybe he didn't say it. You know, I'm gonna mess around getting a fight, and maybe he didn't even do it, and I could hurt him. And if not his fault, he doesn't know what's going on, or you know, there could be more to this story. So I'm doing problem solving and trying to figure out the best way to resolve this. If he did say it, I was gonna whoop him. I knew that, but I was like, I want to make sure because I don't want to do it unnecessarily. 
So he, uh, I see him from the from the back, like you know, a few yards ahead, and I say, uh, "Hey, you know, you can't go around saying that." So I didn't say his name. I just said that out loud. You know, you can't go around saying stuff like that, right? And then he freezes, and then he keeps walking, right? So I'm like, he knows what I'm talking about. But I was like, I want to make sure. So I come around to the front of him, right? And I say, you know what I'm talking about, right? And then he tries to walk around me without, you know. And so I kind of step in front of him because I'm still inquiring, you know what I mean? I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do. At that point, the security hits me so hard, everything goes white. Like he picks me up off of the ground. Everything went white. Uh, they took me into the the, the um, uh, principal's office. They suspended me. They called the police. The police came to the school. They uh, tried to charge me with intimidation. And I said, I didn't threaten him. I didn't, I didn't even accuse him. Like I'm thinking, even when I think back at this now, at 12 or 13 years old, I mean, this was very calculated way of approaching this problem, you know what I mean? And I remember the vice principal looked like, a, um, she looked like a Hillary Clinton, I remember. I remember she just laughed out loud. She just laughed, right? And she was just like, and basically what she said is, understand that if you even make us feel uncomfortable, that's a crime. Like making us feel scared. And I remember in that moment at 12 years old, 13 years old, whatever it was, and I was always a big kid. And I was like, oh, like I'm a black man. And this is what that means. You know what I mean? Like this is something that you're always going to have to be aware of, you know? So all of that saying that, you know, your son who's uh, like me, you know, at, at his age, I was like that size. I was that kid, you know, um, but totally oblivious that how much um, default uh, violent assumptions are made about my just existence, just being, just existing, you know what I mean? And so, you know, in, the, in laying flowers, setting fires, what I'm attempting to do is to have a very nuanced, a very, you know, what, what's the slogan, uh, Sadia, for Amen? Spiritually based, rooted. Spiritually rooted. Yeah, socially again. conscious. Spiritually rooted, socially conscious, spatially relevant. Yeah, exactly. So I was looking to have as a nuanced conversation about it as possible. And so this may be a good place even to start those conversations, um, you know, if you know, if you see fit. Inshallah. And he 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 was with me in Phoenix when. Oh when, right, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Was not, was not six one then, but um, oh, no. and I, I remember one of the things that my daughter said was she said, "Mommy, he's so big, but he's so nice." <laughs> that's nice. And I, that's I, nice. I remember you you made you made it a point to to talk to the children, and, you know, and to look at them and ask them questions. So, uh, you know, I appreciate you also representing uh, what black manhood is for them oh, and man. offering that true, authentic representation for them. So I, I, I really love. Or tell them, I uh, tell them uh, I, I'm greeting them now and I look forward to seeing them again. I will, inshallah. They'll be very excited. Um, <laughs> so I know we can we can continue and talk forever, but mm -hmm. we do want to open it up to questions and answers from the community. Um, so if you have questions, you can type them in the chat or you can send them to Sadia or Benta and they will you know feed them to me. Our first question came in and it, from Jimmy Jones. I think that's our brother Yusuf. It says, Salams, I sense an ancestral voice or perhaps an echoing ancestral influence in the outpouring of your work. Why is this connection so strong and how do you consistently maintain and manifest it? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Well, that's, I, I take that as a, as a very um, profound compliment, mashallah. And, um, yeah, definitely. You know, the ancestors all up and through that for sure, you know, in ways that I can consciously articulate in ways that I know um, I can't um, or that I don't even know about consciously. Um, 
But, um, you know, the as far as keeping that present and, and my work and, and in our work, you know, it's just, you know, the big thing is just acknowledgement, you know, that I come from someone, you know, um, and even on the one of the, the, the tagline on the poster for the project is um, you will be someone's ancestor, act accordingly. And that I like to hold close to me that, you know, when, you know, my daughter or my daughter's daughter or my daughter's son, you know, says, I'm so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of Amir Suleiman, what does that mean? You know, what would that mean to him or her? And what would that mean to whoever he is expressing to? What does he mean to say about that? Does he mean to say, I come from a generous people, or I come from a courageous people, or I come from a knowledgeable people, or whatever, whatever I would like my grandson to say when he mentions I'm the grandson of this one, Amir, what would I like him to say? And whatever I would like him to say, I should be busy with that. You know, I should, uh, I should be prioritizing that. And so, you know, acknowledging the ancestors and acknowledging that we're only this far away from being ancestors ourselves, you know, um, keeps it very fresh in my blood, you know, and fresh in my, in my, in my mind and in my, and it naturally pours out into my art. MashaAllah. And I, I think that's important too, as black Muslims, because we're often told to forget our ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, other people are such and such bent, so such and such, you know, mm -hmm. they can honor their ancestors, but we can't revere ours without being accused of worshiping. So I, 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 mm -hmm. I do like um, that that was included. We have another question. Uh, it's a, a, a statement and then a question. It says, there's a beauty and a pain manifested in this piece. How much of this is intentional and how much am I projecting? You know, when I think about love and pain or beauty and pain, I, I can never separate them, you know? And I don't know, maybe this might even be a dysfunction in me, but you know, even when I think about longing, longing being a, an uncomfortable state, a, a painful state of being, but longing can only come from loving, you know? If I didn't love whoever I was longing for, then there would be no longing. And the only way to stop the longing is to stop the loving. And so the sweetness of love, the sweetness of beauty um, is always contextualized in um, and some sort of, yeah, and something unpleasant, some sort of pain, even um, the beautiful characteristics, the beautiful virtues, you know, um, like the virtue of courage we just mentioned. You know, if all of us here in the Zoom, if we were all in a room together and we wanted to say who is the most courageous among us, danger would have to be present in order for us to know who is most courageous. You know, if we were to say who's the most generous, um, poverty has to be present, you know, either someone that's asking for money or, you know, it's different if you give one dollar, if you're a billionaire, or if you give one dollar and you only have two dollars, then so poverty and the threat of poverty is what allows for generosity to manifest for someone to be known as a generous person, someone to be known as a courageous person, someone to be known as a truthful person. You know, when we say Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, you know, Abu Bakr, the truthful one, he earned that title um, after the Prophet Sallallahu went on his night journey through the seven heavens, meeting the prophets and engaging with Allah Ta'ala. And no one, and he went from Mecca to Jerusalem and, you know, the disbelievers were like, yo, I know that's your man, but yo, have you heard the last thing he said? He said what took three months journey or whatever he did in one night. You telling me you still, <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on man, like seriously, you know what I mean? And his response is if he said it, it was true. And from that day on, he was known as Abu Bakr as Siddiq. So uh, all of these attributes, you know, they can only be manifested with um, with something, the, the way for that beauty to come forth is through trial and tribulation and discomfort and so on. So um, I don't think you're projecting. Um, it is much of the way that I see them inextricably linked. Inshallah. So we are coming up on our last question um, and it's a great one. It says white clothing has various meanings in black African spiritual spaces. 
what is the meaning in this film? Alhamdulillah. So we, um, we use the white clothing and the white casket um, in the feminine space and we use the black clothing and darker lighting in the masculine space. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I won't give a 15 minute answer to this because we don't have 15 minutes, but um, one of the things actually, you know, what I find in blackness and in darkness uh, okay, so the white has its positive and negative manifestations as black does, as masculine does, as feminine does. There's a virtuous one and uh, something other. So in the, in the negative manifestation of whiteness is death. It is uh, the absence of life and whiteness. But then also in the positive aspect of whiteness, there is the, the purity. Uh, and uh, a sign of holiness. And I think this is across many cultures uh, hold this in the, in the color white. In the color black, the negative of it is, um, you know, um, uh, ignorance and um, lack of knowledge and things like that and um, danger. And on the positive side, it is the color of, of life, of the earth, of Adam, of, you know. So um, in the interfacing of them, in truth, the white is a projection. And in that projection, that projection is actually like a masculine energy. And the darkness, which is absorbent, is, um, is actually in the context of this and in the context of other systems of knowledge, um, uh, the negative energy or the, or the I mean, the uh, feminine energy. And so contrasting the women wearing white, uh, and this is like what you find at Hajj is you find the men in all white. Um, uh, but putting the women in white, again, was to create um, a dynamic contrast between the femininity and the, and the whiteness. And then the men are inside of the the darkness of femininity, which isn't darkness in a negative sense in our culture, meaning in Western culture, it's almost exclusively negative, but it is also the color of the womb, it's the color of life, it's the color of, um, you know, our original mother, it's the color of uh, healthy, rich soil. And so, um, but these two coming together again is where the real beauty and the real power lies. And so um, I wanted to, through that, contrast, um, create that dynamic um, electricity. Um, and, I, and I'll mention one last thing to that point is really, and you'll find this all through, I'm about to like give away like a secret. Uh, and you'll find it's all through my poetry, but really all of it is based upon, and this is a good thing to end on because we have two minutes. Uh, all of it is based on really um, la ilaha illallah. And so um, the first part of that phrase is a negative phrase. It's la, it begins with no. There's no God, there's no God. So it's negative and it's atheistic, the first part of it. It's, um, it's dark. And again, when I say dark, I don't mean negative, but it's dark, meaning it's um, absorbent. It's, it, it is the unknown, it is feminine which precedes the masculine in this context. But that's necessary in order to say illallah, um, that it starts off with the affirmation. And so the, the negation coming before the affirmation, but this, this negative charge and this positive charge is what makes the power of the la ilaha illallah. So I use that really as a spine through really all of my work. And if you know how to look for it, you'll find that I put these two together, this, this dark energy and this light energy, and that is what creates the power in the, in the language. But that's it, alhamdulillah. That's a, that's a perfect place to end. You left us with some math, huh? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. <laughs>
Metaphysical dope, mashallah. Yeah, thank mashallah. you so much, Amir. I know we don't have much time. I want to thank Iman for this powerful conversation, um, bringing us together, and you know, just continuing to make dua for you, um, Amir. We, we yeah. often talk about what we would have been doing during the Black Power movement, the Civil Rights movement. You know, if I was alive when James Baldwin was alive, but you know, we are sitting in the presence of Black genius, and I just yeah. hearing it artistry and creativity with all of us. And actually, it's just a perfect time because someone's coming in the office where I am right now. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, I thank you so much. And I thank you, man. I also want to thank um, Starfish Accelerator, who are the ones who helped to did the primary um, financing for it. And man, and man also helped with that uh, financing and Doris Duke and others that I may be forgetting right now. But if you watch the film and watch the credits, you'll see those names. So I thank you very much. Thank y'all so much. Um, there are so there's so many affirmations in the chat. We'll make sure to copy them and send them your way if you didn't get a chance to read them. But and thank you all so much for all your comments in, in the chat. It's very uh, profound. Um, I you know left with a lot to reflect on. And one of the things that I'm thinking about is uh, in this juxtaposition and intertwining of love and loss. Um, thinking about just and you know. Kind of what was mentioned earlier about just the, the the beauty but giving flowers to those who are living is kind of one of the things i was reflecting with rami about actually and um you know right now we have someone in our community who uh also made a very courageous act years ago and is currently facing the repercussions of that i'm talking about sister carrie O'Horn, who's a former um, buffalo police officer who intervened a chokehold and in doing that was was punched in the face um had to get like dental surgery and lost her job uh, for saving a life and so right now on top of the, the um, buffalo city uh council coming to and passing uh an iteration of a law that will allow for there'll be a duty to intervene for police officers we are trying to get her pension back so uh, next Thursday, she's actually going to her second court hearing, and we are trying, we want the mayor of Buffalo and the governor of New York, because this is now at the New York Supreme Court, to uh, know that the world is having eyes on her and this, this case and the, the country and that, um, that we want, we're looking to them to do the right thing. So we're going to put in the chat a uh, text, you know, sample script you can do in calling them and the numbers to call. The appropriate people um, at want to ask you all for five minutes of your time to do that at any point in the next few days. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, and the second thing is that uh, on, on, a, on a brighter note and on a more positive note, Launch, Launch Good has their um, Black History Month Black Leader, Muslim Black Muslim Leaders Awards uh, that, that just went out. The nominations that have just gone out and they're currently voting and um, our uh, several people from the Iman community and our broader community are, are on that. Uh, and so we wanted to ask you all to vote for them. Um, I'm going to start with our sister Binta has been acknowledged as being nominated for the list every voice and sing category. So we're extremely excited about that. And I want to, you know, she just dropped the, the, the link in the chat. So make sure you vote for her. Sister, um, uh, Auntie Angelica is also on that list. Uh, one of our uh, dear community members, Kanoya Ali is on that list. Um, Ustad Obedola Evans is on that. Um, Aya from in the fashion category, she's from Atlanta. Please vote for her as well. And then uh, Marjorie Hill also. So we'll we'll type the names in there as well. But we want to ask y'all to to vote for them. And uh, I think Vinta has some uh, other news to close us with. Yeah, thank you so much, Sadia. Um, so next week we have our um, Sacred Cypher Creative Residency with our dear sister Yesha. I'm going to share her flyer here with y'all. So we will be following up with the email, sending this to you all. We would love for you to join us next week. Um, she's going to be having a women's only Ethiopian movement and meaning class on Monday, which is going to be amazing. She also is going to be talking about being black on the job and offering us some tools, how we can show up in space. And she also is doing an internet cipher towards the end of her week with uh, We Are Wasak and a fellow roster artist, Tammy McCann. And so these are going to be some amazing Amazing events, please feel free to check them out. The links uh, will be in the chat here for you to register. So thank you all so much.
And with that, we'll just um, close in the same way we opened and, and with a note of gratitude uh, to the Most High, um, seeking Allah's protection as, as um, you know, our, our communities are, are navigating these pandemics. Um, ask that Allah bless our featured artists here, um, Brother Amir and Sister Angelica and everyone who is here. Thank you all so much.